Hey Panda Nation, you are listening to the Inverted Gear Podcast with your hosts Nelson and Hillary. Join us every week as we take you behind the scenes into our brand, discuss upcoming projects, and conversate beyond the mat with the interesting people we've met along the way. Hey, Javi, how are you? Doing all right. How are you guys doing? All right. Getting colder in Pennsylvania, so we are planning a getaway. We're actually filling out health forms so we can get into the Dominican Republic uh, this oh, weekend. Wow. Well, that's cool. Oh, hot, warm. Yeah, uh, first trip with the little one. He this uh, this is a warm up trip. Very cool. So, Javi, can you give your a quick intro for the people not familiar with uh, Chicago's Captain America? I, I don't know, man. I, I I don't do anything quick like that. Um, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I'm a lifelong martial artist, been grappling since the late 90s. Uh, I'm a black belt in two different styles of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, 10th Planet and uh, LCCT, which is a Hickson affiliate. Um, so Gi and no Gi. I'm a black belt in Judo. Uh, I've wrestled since I was about 12 years old. I'm a national Sambo champion, a world champion in combat wrestling, and a double world champion in, in Nogi at both brown belt and black belt uh, under the IBJJF. Um, I do a lot of things. I, 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 I train at a lot of gyms, <laughs> and this is pretty much, uh, pretty much what I do when I'm not uh, you know, playing video games or, or, or Magic the Gathering. And how old are you? I'm 44. Gonna be 45 in March. Yeah, so that's that's it's that's quite the journey you got there. I I mean, I started young, but didn't didn't start doing like the real serious stuff until I was much older. Uh, I actually like just the way Facebook memories worked uh, when uh, when the memory of uh, when we went to Japan, mm -hmm. combat wrestling worlds came up. You know, I was like, oh wow, that was that was when I was 40. That was you know four years ago. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I kept pretty quiet and, and was like, just like a general gym rat for a huge number of years. And then, uh, our mutual friend, Riley Bodycomb was basically like, this is dumb. Why don't you go compete? Um, and I had a lot of excuses why I didn't most of which he made me realize were either not actual problems or kind of bullshit anyhow. So. He, he has a way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is he, he, he convinced me that I should compete, and then he's slowly but steadily gotten his way out of competition. <laughs> he's like, I'm too old. I'm like, dude, you're like 10 years younger than me. Yeah. I mean, uh, Riley Riley got me to compete in all his little in-house tournaments for a long time. Whatever yep, yep, side by running. side on a couple yep. of occasions. We, we, we were there. And let's talk a little bit about that trip you mentioned, the, the combat wrestling, and if you can break down the rules real quick before we get too, too into it um okay so uh combat wrestling is a no-gi style that started years and years ago in japan um overall like historically speaking uh i'd say a lot of the early success of some of the most famous japanese mma fighters uh, a lot of them came from there or shuto uh they th those two styles kind of came up together combat wrestling uh has more of a wrestling or sambo focused scoring rule set so um, you get points scored better for the quality of your takedowns. Um, there are points that can be awarded for pinning, although you only get them uh, once in a match. So you can't like win on a pinfall per se, but you can hold someone down for, for a while, establish a good control, get those points, and then you know use that to, to win the overall match. There's a large variety of submissions that are allowed. Pretty much everything is allowed, uh, although in recent years to try and make the sport appeal to a uh, to like a wider audience they actually did remove heel hooks because a lot of jujitsu guys um particularly from certain other countries if if i was led to believe the correct thing uh didn't really want to play under those rules so like toe holds knee bars and all that stuff's all legal there's no belt ranks in it so um anyone can compete against anyone more like wrestling um and yeah uh i I took a silver medal at the national qualifier here in, in the U.S., but we didn't have somebody in my age category for my weight class, so uh, I got that spot as a result anyhow. Um, 
and uh, we all went to Japan together to to fight at the World Championship. That was a fun trip. That was a fantastic trip. Uh, Yeah, like, I tell people all the time, like, I still remember watching on television as, like, a little, little kid. I was probably, I don't know, like, four or five years old or something like that when it came out. Um, Actually, hold on. Oh, is it over here? So if you're listening to this, have you sprinted away to look for something? I thought I knew exactly where it was, but I didn't. Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there was a there, there was a TV show, like a, a drama series that my grandmother watched on like CBS or something, and it was uh, it was an adaptation of the the novel Shogun. Oh yes. And I remember I think- as a, like a little little kid, not really understanding what was going on, and definitely not understanding the, the the finer plot points of it but like watching with her and, and being like oh wow this is really neat like like this this culture of the far east and like i, I love the way the, the the kimonos looked and you know freaking katanas which of course were just you know samurai swords back then and and whatnot and yeah like so as a young kid i was really interested in japan as a place uh, and then as I got older, you know, like ninjas became a big thing in the 80s and Ninja Turtles and, and, and like all the martial arts, you know, seemed to come from there, you know, karate with Karate Kid and all that. So like I got, well, I, you know, Karate Kid was specifically Okinawa, but regardless, I got, I got like really interested. I was an early days Japanophile in that way um, before terms like weeb <laughs> were, were used. Uh, and yeah, so like. The idea of doing martial arts in kind of like the motherland of martial arts at a world championship level and being able to travel there with like a bunch of my friends was just like an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And I remember we all got there a few days early so we could enjoy a little bit. And Mm -hmm. some of us travel afterwards too. But yeah, my wife Karen right, actually showed up after the whole tournament to to just have fun and and hang out in Japan. Yeah, I remember going with you guys to um, the Kotokan, mm-hmm. and you walking around the Kotokan is always such a cool experience. And yeah, the the museum stuff that they have there is so cool. Yes, yeah, and uh, they very clearly printed in English signs saying "Don't take pictures," and and here's Karen snapping pictures the whole time. <laughs> nobody said anything and we didn't realize until afterwards when we got out that that like oh that sign there was talking about you that the other, yeah the other thing too is everybody that works there mm-hmm. has cauliflower ears and perfect posture <laughs> so you know <laughs> you will get thrown if you act up so i have a funny additional story i don't know if you guys are still around um so i had made it a thing i'm like i have to train at the Kodakon. how can i not and the weird thing is, like, for those that don't know, like, the Kodokan is kind of like the, the spiritual home of judo, but there are other universities and whatnot that, uh, you know, field, like, better teams of competitors. It's not like all the best people in judo are from the Kodokan just because the Kodokan is this really important place. Um, so, like, I wanted to go and train there, and I had been warned by several older, more experienced black belts that are trained there that, you know, like, hey, man, you know, like, don't get your hopes up. Like, you've probably trained with better judoka, you know, doing like national camps or, or, or seminars where, where Olympians come in or whatnot. So don't be disappointed if like you go there and it's just like a bunch of old men that just want to do Nawaza or, or, you know, or whatnot. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I kind of put it off and put it off. Um, wasn't feeling well one day. I was like, oh no, I'm going to get sick and not be able to do it. And then the, like the next day I felt better. I'm like, we're doing this now before something happens. So uh, I roll up in there and there, there's this young, very attractive Japanese woman working the front desk. And she's like, um, hi, can I help you? I'm like, yeah, I, I want to, I want to do the judo training tonight. And she looks at me with this like, like vaguely masked look of horror on her face. Like, just like, I'm, I'm like, oh, what have I, did I, did I say something wrong? You know, like, and she's like, are, are you sure you want to train tonight? I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of have to, like, I, I'm leaving soon, but, you know, go back, going back to America. She's like, okay, um, how experienced are you? I'm like, oh, I'm a black belt. 
And like, that was maybe not the best answer. Cause it, she's like, whatever. Um, so she asked me like fill out some forms and explains things, you know, go, go to the area to like walk around and, and, and get changed and whatnot. And I go back there and like, there's like a lot of dudes. Um, like, I'm like, okay, apparently like today's going to be like a big class. And, uh, and I get out there and sure enough, it's packed. Like you, you know, you know how big the Kodakon main room is and it's full. And what I come to find out later, because there were a bunch of guys from, from different clubs in Europe, and, and I ran into quite a few guys that, that had really good English and whatnot. Um, the night I chose to go, apparently they have like some agreement where the Kodakon is neutral grounds. So competition teams that otherwise would not cross train with each other all meet at the Kodakon from various local universities. And we had a variety of visiting um uh, competition teams from god what was it? it was like france the uk germany so every top team in the world was there <laughs> yeah yeah basically so i i, I got mauled <laughs> like everyone who was my size was like you know going for like olympic titles and everything the, the, yeah it was it was nuts so it was like really fortunate in terms of of uh you know like it was a cool experience but yeah, I did, I did very not well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the woman at the front desk was concerned for my safety and well-being. So it's like, how good is your brick falling? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, somewhere I have footage of Karen, you know, like she sat up in the, in the bleacher section up top and, and yeah, there's this, there's this one uh, kid from, uh, I want to say Germany that just like, just contemptuously tossed me with an Uchimata and was just like, Oh, this guy's no good, and continue to do it nonstop, like just just beautiful setups and everything. Um, so yeah, there's there's levels to the game, and also he was probably twenty years younger than me. Yeah, the the judo levels are a funny are a funny thing. As much as jiu jitsu has grown, mm -hmm. and how how much people are putting into their training and becoming full time athletes and whatever you want to call it, professional athletes. Mm -hmm the level of some of these judo guys that have been doing it forever in state sponsor programs yeah and with head coaches since they were eight years old and strength conditioning and flying all over the world to compete at junior olympics and whatnot it is crazy yeah. how i skilled they are at this one thing they're really good at spinning to the right and bending forward <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because that's the funny thing about judo is most of these guys. Uh, was it was their term Tokuwaza? Like Tokuwaza, favorite? yeah. yeah. Tokuwaza yeah. is the favorite technique. Your, and your favorite technique, um, of which, yeah, like I never really had one that was like that. Like I have stuff that I'm good at. You know, mm -hmm. like like I've got a good Yoko Tomonagi to one direction. I, I I've got a good you know drop sail. You know, like like there, there's all these things that I'm good at, but. There's nothing that I'm like, oh, that guy's known for that. Yeah. You know. And it's stuff they're so good that they they can hit it on Olympic level mm -hmm. people. And it's 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 hilarious. And the other thing too is like the rules they kind of like narrow it down because the Eastern Europeans were kind of like muddying the waters a little bit with like the forward stance mm -hmm. and getting on the legs and all the pickups. So that was kind of changing the game. What about 10 years ago was when the rules the rules changed. Oh god. Um so yeah, I, I want to say it was like 2012 ish, like like the lead yeah. up. To, but like the funny thing is, um, so I did a seminar. Like, and bear in mind, like I wasn't actually there, so I'm taking his word for it. But I did a seminar with Neil Adams, who was there when the they decided the IJF decided to change the rules, and his explanation for it was something that no one had ever told me before. Cause like everyone else I knew was like, Oh, the Eastern Europeans do this. The Russians do that. The Mongolians do this. And the Japanese don't like it. And that's always been kind of like the excuse. And he's like, no, 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 that that's not it at all. In fact, the Russians were in favor of the changes. Like they, they voted in favor. I was like, okay, so, so what was it? And he's like, do you remember when there was a movement to kick wrestling out of the Olympics. And I'm like, of course I remember. I still have the Save Olympic Wrestling t-shirt. You know, like, we all went nuts for that. He's like, yeah, so um, 
The reason that happened was because of, and he starts listing off like these technical issues that the Olympic committee had with like basically why wrestling is boring and, and shouldn't be in the Olympics. None of which of course I agree with and none of which Neil Adams agreed with, but um, I could see how like to somebody who doesn't know what's going on, it's confusing. And he's like, Basically, they came to us in judo and we're like, you guys are just like wrestling, uh, only you wear a different uniform. Wrestling's on the chopping block. If you don't change what you're doing, we're also going to eliminate you. And all the judo guys were like in a panic. and We're like, how can we make our sport less like wrestling? And thus, that's how the the leg touch ban and, and the, the scoring changes scoring changes worked to try and make it more action packed and more appealing to like the casual audience. Um, and let's be honest, like, like understanding that somebody lost because they got thrown onto their back isn't a hard thing to explain. Um, and it's not a hard thing to visualize, but understanding like the intricacies of the other scoring aspects can be pretty difficult. And if you're concerned that like wrestling, literally one of the oldest sports is going to get you know removed because of too much grabbing of legs and, and laying on top of each other, you're going to make an effort to remove that kind of stuff as well. So yeah. that's the, that's the excuse as explained by, by the voice of judo. The Neil voice Adam. of judo. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I agree uh, to a certain extent is like you said, the, the scoring changes for those that are unaware, the lowest score change, the lowest point system. So it was what Juco and Coca. Yeah. The Coca was already out by the time I was competing. Um, but yeah, Yuko stuck around for a little while afterwards, if I recall, and they eventually got rid of that. So like right now it's only Epon and Wazari. So it's either a full point where you just win the match immediately, right. either by a giant throw to the person's back, high amplitude. So you're demonstrating control. Yeah. At the end of the day, when we're talking wrestling rules, you're demonstrating control. So judo rules, I'm demonstrating control by grabbing an opponent and tossing him to his back, hitting him with the planet. Or put him in a in a pin, holding him for was it thirty seconds, twenty seconds, 20, I believe. twenty seconds, and or submission point where he has to either tap or he's gonna go to sleep. Right. And, and there's some intricacies in there about how you stop a pin, how to stop a submission. Right. Yeah. The, but, the, the plane of the back that has to be maintained towards the mat. You know, they have to break yeah. ninety. Um, you know, only certain submissions are legal. Pretty much. The vast majority of chokes and uh, with the collar or or yeah. like you're naked and whatnot and uh, arm locks, no leg locks in in judo competition. Yeah, but the the rule changes were effective to weed out the styles that they consider mudding the waters and getting like closer to wrestling than it should have been like all the like all the katakurumas and uh, so all the all the fireman's carries and uh, pickups by the legs or double legs. Uh, some of the Mongolian athletes were, especially the heavyweights, they were like rugby tackling people. Mm -hmm. And it was hilarious because this, like, you know, tall European guys were coming in, very high stance, trying to, like, you know, set right. up their grips and go, uh, go for a giant of soto. Like, then this Mongol these short Mongolian guys just, <laughs> guess what? Like, like a Goldberg spear. But, yeah. Uh... And it was amazing. And, like, for me, that was fun to watch. But it did not look like judo in the classical in, sense. In the classic so sense. yeah, it, it didn't look like the classic upright flowing sort of Japanese ideal judo that, you know, certain, certain countries like have a certain yeah. style to them. Obviously there's exceptions and whatnot, but like, like the French and the Japanese have like a very beautiful flowing upright stance in general. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the ideal that, that like, they really would like the sport to look like, but I hate the idea of getting rid of effective techniques just cause they're kind of ugly. Well, the, the other thing too, is as a sport has evolved and they're like, you know, the rules that keeps getting gamed, some of the stuff that's happening now, especially with the reverse Seunagis is mm -hmm. just fascinating how, how we changed the rule set to maintain this, the way the sport looks like, and then people just game the rules. Right, to in figure a different out way. Yeah. 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 And then, like, now some of the Mongolian guys are just pulling on lapels to set up a front headlock and then either trip you up or put you down with a front headlock. Right. Right. And we don't I, know more I, wrestling. <laughs> I, again, like, yeah, it's like in the spirit of the rules, but still doesn't look like judo. Hillary, it's uh, what, what did you win in judo? Uh, 
Um, it was like judo nationals out in California back then. Oh my god, probably many. Two, yeah, many years ago. And all the all the double legs were were in place. Yeah, my jam was Maroto Gary, the double leg. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> and that's pretty much how I. And I just remember like um, this was when I trained at Solos too, and it was required to be a green belt to earn your purple belt in jujitsu right. at his school, and it was shared with a judo program. Um, and I remember like when Solo would bring all his guys in to train for like the big tournaments, they would still run through and do judo tournaments kind of as warm up matches. Right. Just to, and you would to just to be comfortable on your feet, but the rules were like totally different back then. <laughs> yeah. And especially now, if you watch uh, like jiu jitsu, like the Masters divisions, there's not a lot of guard pulling. Definitely less. Uh, I, I I obviously competed them still, so I I definitely run into my fair share of guard pullers. But I, I, I would let me rephrase that: heavier weights, especially. Oh yeah, I well, think <laughs> heavier weights like those guys do not want to be in the bottom for six five six minutes. Yeah. And you see a lot, especially I was watching like uh, Nogi Worlds, and I watched like the heavyweight at uh, Masters One and Masters Two. So it would be or I, if I wanted to compete again, and like yeah, lots 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 of stand up. And lots of lots of heavy clubs and a uh, lot of lot of real aggressive circling, trying not to get called for for stalling. <laughs> not a yeah, lot. Yeah, there's. Shots. I mean, there's no shot clock, so yeah, it's, exactly. Whatever, and that, this uh, Pedro Mourinho kind of like exploited a loophole now, where mm -hmm. is like I'm a circle, and then once you shoot on me, I'm gonna slap a guillotine on and push you out of bounds, right. and that might give me an advantage, right. <laughs> Well, it, it, isn't it so long as it looks like you're running from the submission? Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. If he if he like if he pushes you pushes you out, the, it's not necessarily. But if like he gets you to to back away from him, to the fan, yeah. In in, yeah. in the so the way it's it depends if I believe it's like if you run out of bounds, it looks like you're fleeing. It's two points, right. but if you, there's, there's a serious submission locked and you got a pounce out of bounds, it's an advantage. This from and we took the referee course maybe a month ago, so we should remember this better. But I believe that's the way it works. Right. So we went over judo and some sambo. Well, sambo. Let's talk about your sambo experience real quick and combat wrestling. And sambo rules that it's pretty much mirror. It's just the difference is there's going to be a jacket pretty on. Pretty similar, like like you know me and Vlad. And Riley have discussed it that like Sambo doesn't have like a no gi rule set that's well known. Like I'm sure some guys have experimented around with it and whatnot. But there's no like no gi Sambo, like or no, no Kirka. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so like, because uh, even even combat Sambo, which you know most people look at it and it's like e easy to say, it's like MMA in a jacket. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, like they, they don't have a like we take the jacket off and here's the rule set. So combat wrestling kind of is that there's there's some things that aren't conventionally allowed or score different but overall like it plays really well and uh the strategies work pretty similarly um uh but yeah like the like sambo has specifically like the total victory throw which is you toss a guy clean on his back with power and control and you stay on your feet and it's over that's that's like their ipon uh, and combat wrestling doesn't have that per se, but it has like a high scoring, you know, like, oh, you, you threw him good. Here's a bunch of points. I want to say that's a four point, but I, I actually have to double check the rules. Also, it's really hard unless you just pick somebody up and throw them <laughs> versus like, you know, in Sambo, like, especially if you do like a, a forward throw mm -hmm. is you're more likely to stay in your feet. Well, and like, really is, quick, well, like, you... really quick before we go down this rabbit hole, yeah. you mentioned combat sambo mm -hmm. combat sambo rule set the thing that fascinates me the most the knockdown their punches don't score <laughs> at all unless you knock somebody out they fall on their back and that counts as a throw <laughs> yeah the way they fall after you punch or kick them determines whether or not you get any points for that or headbutt yeah sorry or headbutt which is which is great yeah that that's always a shocking one but yeah, um, so uh, the thing with the thing with sambo or combat sambo is you could like just time the most perfect foot sweep ever, sweep a guy clean off his feet. He falls flat on his back, takes like the most perfect break fall ever, and it's like it's over, man. Like yeah, 
so like it, it's not always like lift the guy up, drop him a certain way, you know. Um, so like those type of throws, and like there's all these explanations as to why it's like that. I think it's mostly like that because they were trying to adapt the way judo worked at the time. Um, but like the concept, the the military explanation for it is that like you as a soldier don't want to get dragged to the ground in a in, in an encounter, and then like dude's buddies come along and curb stomp you while you're rolling around on the ground with the other guy. So the idea is it's most valuable to be able to drop somebody on their head, preferably on a really hard surface. They get knocked unconscious or disoriented enough um, that then you proceed to like bayonet them, pull out your knife, stab them, you know, curb stomp them yourself, and then move on to the next soldier. <laughs> so really quick for those unaware, Sambo, quick history. <laughs> oh, God. How quick of a quick history can we really do? So Russian Russian army. Wait, uh, what what's the guy's name? Oh, the, I, I'm gonna embarrass myself and and mispronounce all the names. Um, but so there's like three guys that are credited with um with kind of like the creation and early development of Sambo. Two of whom didn't really work directly together initially they were just like working at opposite ends uh one style as a result is like this sort of softer like think of it like like the difference between like hard style kung fu and soft style kung fu but with more grappling um <laughs> so yeah like but they were developing this program to sort of make a native russian martial arts style to take against like the great martial arts styles of japan and 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 the far east and the idea was it was going to be designed and used predominantly in war so this was like initially sort of like a military secret but eventually the sportive aspects became very popular and that's how most people know it today yeah um, what i find fascinating is they, they while well, a lot of people is like yeah they're just doing judo they just grab judo and wrestling it's like yeah but also like russia has a ton of like regional right the native styles. wrestling style like native styles with a jacket and without the jacket mm -hmm. so some of these guys have been doing like grew up doing all these different yeah. regional styles and then only wrestling belt wrestling you know chita yeah. oba is is one of the more cited ones because like you can you can like look at samba and be like oh that grip comes from this wrestling style that's native to georgia um so yeah th there's a bunch of that stuff you know, like like um, Mongolian bulk, you know, definitely had some influence. Um, there's a there's a pretty cool book that I have that talks about like Russian judo, and it like goes in and, and like lists a lot of like the native regional styles, um, and, and gives examples in certain cases of like this technique is most likely from this. It's used by these athletes because in their native system they wear this uniform, and that's why they prefer this grip. So the, yeah. the, the Sambo jacket, for those that don't know, we call it a kurtka, um, looks pretty similar at first glance to like a judo or jiu-jitsu gi, um, but the way the belt's designed is there's belt loops so that once you tie on your belt, there can be no screwing around with, oh, my belt's untied and it's fallen, fallen off and it's no longer giving proper leverage. Um, you know, the ref doesn't have to stop it for pretty much anything like that. Uh, and also there's a... And these... I don't find that these play a big role, but there's there's these little epaulets built into the shoulder um, that kind of, like, there's various explanations to what they are supposed to represent, but in my eyes, they best represent, like, the area of a vest that you would link your grips into, which can be a little hard to precisely simulate without that. So there's certain styles that are vest wrestling styles um, that, are, that, that are from those regions, and then there's other styles that are belt wrestling styles. So the combination of having the epaulets gives you the exact same grips on a jacket as you would otherwise have on just a vest. And then the the fact that the belt can't really untie or spin around or, or ride up or, or down in any way means that suddenly the belt wrestling styles can use all their, their techniques to the maximum. Yeah. If you'd ever tried to do some of that stuff in judo or jiu-jitsu when the gi, the belt is not going into the gi, mm -hmm. as soon as you get like over the back grip, the belt sliding side to side, like you know, the the leverage is just not the same right. that it would be with a sambo jacket. 
I mean, it's usually the same for like the first 30 seconds to a minute of, of work and, and, and tugging around and whatnot. But it's after that, yeah, it's tired. loosened up. I <laughs> not going to name them by names, but like, I got yelled at by one of my jujitsu coaches one time. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like tying my belt. He's like, you don't understand. You're going to fight at a high level. You want that belt tied as loose as possible so that if you need a break, it'll come off. <laughs> it's like, this is a bet move. You got the veterans do it. Yeah, yeah. Cause, cause like, I like, I, I do like a super tight knot because I want to tie it once and, and forget about it. And usually my belt stays on tied exactly the way I tied it on. Like the lapels come loose and whatnot. I have to tuck them in at the end of a long match. But yeah, like my belt's going to stay on. And he's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How are you going to get your timeouts if you uh, if you tie your belt right? It reminded me. Remember when we? I think it was Jiu-Jitsu Revolution. Like their rule on the mat for rolling, it's like if your belt comes off, you're not stopping to retie it. You're just leaving it off. Yeah, the <laughs> that, they that had made things a little more complicated. Yeah, it was. Uh, they had like a marathon roll or something. It's like I need my break to re to fix my belt. <laughs> yeah, I think we. Yeah, well, our, our, our buddy, our buddy decided. Yeah, our buddy decided to invite us down, and then we drove like five hours. To Virginia. We drove five hours to Virginia, I believe. Okay. And then as soon as we get there, he's like, oh, we should go train. I was like, okay, sure. We'll go train. And it was marathon roll and everybody needed to do what, whatever it was, like 10, 10, five, six, ten, six minute rounds, six uh, four, yeah. maybe 30 seconds in between and all these rules. So no water, no retying your belt. It's just real Iron Man stuff. Yeah. So like, it was like this Iron Man session out and like, I'm looking at my friend. I'm like, we just got off the car, man. Yeah. <laughs> the car was six hours, and there was no warning that this was what was happening. Right, right. And I was like, okay, we're we're survive here. I I can stall right. real good. So yeah, no, I I mean, you usually if the belt comes off, like I'll tell people, like just just toss it to the side. You know, like I I don't really care about it. But then every once in a while, I'll regret that decision. So I'm like, man, I would have really liked to thrown you with the grip that is not there currently. So. That's fascinating. So we went through uh, stand-up styles. Let's start talking about some more, 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 more ground, grappling. more ground, Nuance. more ground stuff. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating that you went through both gi and no gi belting systems. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um. Yeah. I mean, you, like, you did it at the same time, correct? Not quite the same time, but within a couple of years of each other. And I did it bass backwards relative to how most people seem to do these things. So um, I I come from originally like a no-gi background through like amateur wrestling and catch wrestling. Um, I, I didn't – when I came up, I didn't really like the culture that was around jiu-jitsu. Like not just locally, but like on a general level um, where it was like, you know, if, if – if you haven't been around in, in like MMA and, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu long enough, like you probably haven't quite experienced like what the, the early to, to mid nineties were like, where if like a Jiu Jitsu fighter beat the ever loving hell out of somebody with punches, it was because Jiu Jitsu like, but if a Jiu Jitsu fighter lost under any circumstance, it was because the opponent had clearly studied Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like it, it was this weird cult of no matter what happens, it's always because of jujitsu. It was really annoying and, and dealing with that at c certain local schools and whatnot. I was just like, Ugh, this, this is terrible. Um, it wasn't what I was looking for for a variety of reasons. So I, like I stuck with doing like no gi catch wrestling, submission wrestling for a good long while. And even like some of the traditional martial arts that I had studied, a lot of the guys preferred to train in like street clothes, like, like basically like sweatpants and t-shirts as opposed to wearing like formal gear like a gi because you know they wanted to be like street ready the gis and and whatnot would only come out during like the, the the winter seasons uh but regardless eventually um just like the weirdest of circumstances i my catch wrestling crew kind of life got in the way fell apart and i wasn't really doing as much no gi as i would like but i had started doing judo with my kids um i'd always loved judo and uh, at first, I really, really sucked at it. I, I want to point that out. Like, I, I went into this particular judo club and just wrestled the shit out of everyone. But they had some really, really good wrestlers there. So it was like, oh, we, we do that too. Here, drop the jacket. And, and I was like, oh, these guys are quite good. 
Uh, but yeah, I was like, I was like doing like full Nelsons and leg locks. to so like judo guys didn't, didn't know any better really. Uh, also kind of wanted to kind of wanted to, to win, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was explained to me very quickly that that was cool at that gym. So long as, you know, my training partners were cool with it. And a lot of the guys at that gym had wrestling backgrounds and also like they competed at things like Naga in both Gi and no Gi. So I was like, Oh, cool. You know, like I can do the no Gi stuff here, but I can also do, you know, learn judo in the Gi properly. Um, we had a few MMA fighters and whatnot too. So regardless, I got like my introduction to like serious Gi training through judo. So then I would, you know, we, we would have jujitsu guys that would come in periodically and uh, a lot of them were like, oh, we're going to tool up these judo guys once it hits the ground. But surprise, you know, my judo school actually did a lot of newaza and guys like me had years of grappling experience. So that usually didn't go so well for them. And through like the weirdest of circumstances, uh, I found out about both a Sambo school that was like 15 minutes from my house um, and also joined 10th Planet Chicago within like a month of each other. So I was doing judo, sambo, and 10th planet jujitsu all concurrently, like, you know, just for a period of probably four years. Uh, and I had specifically chosen 10th planet because one, I, I did like a lot of the stuff Eddie did, especially as it related to like the truck position and the, uh, and the twister and his variations on how to get into that. This was long before like the, the leg lock revolution. Um, so I liked, I liked kind of his approach to things in that regard. Um, wasn't too crazy about like rubber guard, but I was a flexible dude and, and felt like I could do that stuff. Um, and then like, I had always really wanted to do the Sambo. So I was, I was getting like all of my gi training was, was getting done at judo and Sambo. And I felt like I was, since I wasn't doing like catch wrestling every single day anymore, I felt like I was like kind of slipping in, in no gi. Like I wasn't able to keep up with no gi. Uh, training because you know we would do occasional no gi at the judo club but it wasn't like on the schedule it was based on who showed up um so yeah so i, I joined 10th planet because i just wanted to keep practicing no gi and i was trying real hard even though people were telling me not to I was trying real hard to have like roughly a 50 50 split in my training time between gi and no gi uh and this was like i don't know 2012 or so blasphemy book man yeah yeah absolute blasphemy um and like I would, I would cross train at, at various jujitsu gyms and do generally fine. Uh, like our, our mutual friend Tom Grant, um, he started training sambo with me and was like, "Hey, this guy's like pretty good on the ground. This is not what I was expecting." So he invited me to his jujitsu club, um, which was quite a ways away. And uh, yeah, I would go in there, you know, wearing like a white belt in the gi because I wasn't really sure what was appropriate. Um, at the time, I think I was a, a blue belt in 10th planet and, you know, like, you know, a brown belt or so in, in judo. Um, and guys were like, Oh, a white belt, fresh blood. And, uh, yeah, that also didn't go well for them. <laughs> so, but that was like, that was kind of like my real serious introduction. Cause I had done like a few classes here or there and some seminars and whatnot. That was my first real introduction to, uh, like dedicated gi jujitsu training. And even then, I kind of avoided it for a while, uh, just as I'm like, nah, what I do in judo is enough. I don't want to. I want to be playing like these spider guards and the, these goofy lasso guards and lapel guards were starting to become a thing. So those were super weird looking and also illegal in judo. So I was like, I don't need that for anything that I'm doing right now. And eventually, I went to Marcelo Garcia's academy and got my butt kicked uh, by a guy who had a really, really good spider guard. I was like, okay, maybe I need to learn this. The old, I got to learn it so I understand how to beat it. Right, right, exactly. That's that's basically been the motivation for me switching arts or gyms or studying with specific people for the majority of my journey is I get my butt kicked by something that I thought I had an easy answer for, but it was just working for me because the person I was doing it on probably sucked at it. And then I'll yeah. run into a guy who's like truly world class and be like, oh, Oh, this is actually a thing. Damn it. Yeah, when I started training with the guys at Ten Planet Battleham, mm -hmm. I understood leg locks. I've trained leg locks. I've trained with Riley, but I never put a considerable amount of time training with people that are doing it every day right. and are competing at like a world class level. So 
it took it took a few months to get like you know my timing right and then i would take time off and then there was all this all these transitions and all these different getting hit with the fresh information set. right yeah all this fresh information was keep coming down the last it's called six seven years the leg locks if you just the, the amount of leg lock net knowledge and transitions and setups is kind of like exponentially higher than what we were used to in 2012, 2013, 2014. Right. And, you know, the counter to the counter to the counter situations are just hilarious now. I so mean, I, I try to keep up with it pretty well. You know, I, I, I work with a lot of, you know, pretty high level guys that are, are very serious competitors. I study as much as I can. But yeah, like the difference between and, and actually this is uh, this is we've got two 10th planets here in like the Chicagoland area. We got 10th planet Chicago where I'm from originally. And, uh, and then 10th planet Lombard run by my friend Omar and Omar's guys, a lot of real serious competitors. He's got a, uh, one of the biggest, best open mats, uh, in the Chicagoland area at this point. And a lot of his guys are like now, you know, all these years later are like very, very good leg lockers. Okay. And, and like very dedicated to that path. So, one of my training partners who I do gi with over at one of the other schools asked me one time, he's like, Hey, what do you think? Of, you know, should I, should I go try out, you know, the open mat? I'm like, yeah, yeah, definitely go do it. You know? And, and when you do, you know, come back and, and let me know how it goes smirk, you know? And uh, so he runs off to the open mat and he's like a, a good purple belt competitor, ready for his Brown belt competes on a, uh, you know, on, on a very high level and whatnot. And he comes back to me. He's like, so I'm like, what'd you think? He's like, leg locks nothing but leg locks and i was like how'd you do it? he's like i got tapped a bunch before i figured out that i was doing everything wrong and now like he wants me to show him all this stuff that previously he was kind of like eh, i can't do it in the gi i don't need to know that oh, also he's a master's division competitor so like he can't he can't even do it in no gi you know yeah which i still find to be a very very strange rule but whatever i i think that will change eventually yeah, yeah. But no, for well, now, well, enough with the current crop of adults switch over to masters division, and they're like, "Hey, man, what about heel hooks?" Yeah, I think at least masters one will change eventually, and I really think eventually, if we allow ankle locks, we should allow knee bars, mm -hmm. because over the years, there's been enough situations where there's a there's a scramble and yeah, a, a blue belt has an ankle lock, and the guy turns it into a knee bar to escape, and then he just looks at the ref like. Yeah, he has me in a knee bar. He has me in a knee bar. He's like, yeah, you turn into it. <laughs> right, right. But what if but, the ref blinks at the wrong moment and doesn't realize how the transition happens? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's that's what, like, and then that's what happens. Say. I've seen it go either way. But what I was going to say is the ankle locks and not the ankle locks, the leg lock game, which I totally I understood, it took you putting the reps in against really good people. Mm -hmm. And now coming back after COVID, especially, uh, we took what, like a year and a half off? coming back and going to train with the planet guys everybody's back uh back takes at back control got so much better Off and i think blocks or just in general i think both okay but th there's definitely uh more transit they've been working on those like he defends leg lock mm -hmm. you know he turns away to defend the leg lock i'm gonna jump Take on the back, back. Yeah. but from anywhere really some of these top guys are so good at taking the back and so good at controlling the body triangle once they get it and flip side, you know, I'm I've been I'm been training for 14 years. I'm a black belt. Some of these lower level guys that I get to roll with, like blue and purple belts coming up in the, the template system. I can think I can pass a guard, take the back, or sometimes I get to I get a bolo off and get to their back. I have a really hard time controlling them there and submitting right, them. They, their defense is leveled up from what you're used to, right? They're they're yeah. like <laughs> the back defense that these people have, usually, you know. But if it was a gi, it was a gi thing. Well, I have more options, but I'm so used to it. if I if I take a blue belt back, I should be able to submit him. Right. But I got like, back. No, no man. I got back, and then I, these guys were like, "Nope, nope." I, I do I, EBI rounds. Yes, you know how many EBI rounds I've yeah. done. You know how much time I've spent on back defense. Have you experienced the same, Hillary? Oh yeah. <laughs> you notice the difference? It's been fun. I think it's been making my. My um, back takes a lot better and my defense a lot better. Just like you said, spending more time there. And it is, it's coming off the guard passes, and but it's coming off recovering from guard passes. It's just like these crazy scrambles. Like it just becomes like a cat and mouse chase. Like 
who's going to take your back first and are they going to stay there? It's like, I don't know. And, and how it comes off of just like, okay, trying to pass the guard, they bump you back into like a leg lock, come back up, pass, look for a back take, or maybe before you can take their back there on your back. It's, it's been pretty, I've had some crazy rounds over there. It's been fun. Yeah. The, it's not just about passing and pinning anymore, you know? Right. Especially I mean, in, Abu, in Abu Dhabi year. Yeah. Where yeah. wrestling, wrestling matters and getting to the back matters. So I've been doing a lot. We've been doing a lot of one minute, two minute rounds. I'm cycling in and out. And the scrambles, if you start from the feet, the scramble eventually is going to be. So you, you don't want to get scored on. So a lot of times you're exposing your back. So you're going to get somebody's either going to jump on your back or jump on a leg lock. Right. And yeah, I mean, Abu Dhabi rules definitely change things. You know, I, I, yeah. I've, I've worked at a couple of gyms that that will use that as kind of like their no-gi rule set. Um, and then, like, guys give wrong reaction when we change the rule sets because it becomes so ingrained as to how you can, like, wrestle up and not get scored on. And it's like, no, yeah. no, no, you're, 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 that's going to get you scored on in the IBJJF. Yeah. You know? well, um, the other thing, too, is, like, now – uh, what is it, the WNL rule set is becoming more and more popular? Uh, who's yeah, number yeah. One? I'm, I'm kind of interested in that uh, to see where that goes in the next year or two, you know, if more people adopt it and, and use it. EBI overtime rounds, while they definitely served a really good purpose, the vast majority of people that I know that, you know, either compete or watch, they're like, can we not do that as like the final round? Um, you know, or, or at least less of them. <laughs> Yeah, but like you, because EVI was such a premier tournament for a while, it had like the big prize money and it was like pay per view. Before he switched to combat, combat jiu jitsu, and people kind of lost interest, in my opinion. EBI says uh, Eddie says EBI is coming back. Well, well, we'll see. We'll see where we're at now. But I think he would if it stayed the same. If it, because it, because even the smaller tournaments were adapting the EVI rule set. Yeah, I mean, BJJ Fanatics did, like, a tournament series, like, the Brown Belt uh, yeah. tournament that they did had EBI overtime, if I remember correctly. And that rule set, like we said, because people would – any rule set that you have, people are going to game the rule set. Right. And it seemed for a while, EBI, everybody skewed towards don't get submitted. Right. So escaping if you're on the – Escaping – and then escaping overtime, Right. right. So, work on your leg lock defense. And I mean, work I, on your back defense. And you'll I feel be like okay. EBI overall, and and that movement in general, and certain specific people in that movement. But like, I feel like that served a good purpose in terms of leveling up people's awareness of weaknesses in their game. Because like, if you went into an EBI or similar format uh, tournament and you haven't been working your overtime rounds, you could be completely dominating somebody throughout the whole thing. It's like, oh, I've scored four bajillion points, and then lose, you know, because your back escapes aren't on point. Because you assume that once you've locked a body triangle, this guy has no way out, while this guy has, you know, been practicing his body triangle and his arm bar and, and whatnot escapes. And, and, and yeah, you, you really need to be on point. So, like, I really like the purpose that it served, and... You know, a lot of rule set changes, even if I don't agree with them at the time, like going back to judo, we, we banned leg touches. Um, guys that were katagruma specialists, like some guys definitely fell off, but other guys were just like, how can I adapt this to work under the new rules? And we now we have all these new variations on throws, some of which are probably faster and more efficient um, that are that, that are better known or or have been invented, discovered, whatever you want to call it. Um, as a result of that rule change. Yeah. So, you know, whenever there's a rule change, I feel like it's typically going to, we might lose some stuff, at least short term, but uh, it's typically going to produce new stuff. And that new stuff can be like really fun and exciting. Yeah, like Baron I mean, Bolos probably would not have existed in their current form without the specific rules that helped create them. Yeah. The other, the other thing too is like where as a skill development side, if you're a new jiu-jitsu student, or you're an athlete and you want to compete and you've been training for two years, the rule set that you want to compete in is going to form your curriculum. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in the IVJJF and you want to place at IVJJF tournaments, the fastest way to get there is really good, get really good at Berimbolo. Mm -hmm. 
right. because you're gonna pull guard so you don't have to work on takedowns right and then you're gonna spin around until you get to somebody's back so you don't have to work on passing <laughs> get the back or come up on top and mount so you are circumventing the whole system there by there's all these things you have to learn eventually but you can backfill later if you get really good at this one skill then leg locks were kind of that thing for nogi where if i get really good at this leg lock positions i don't have to work on passing i don't really have to really work on upper body control because i can i can get really good at this area because everybody else is slacking on it right like that's the real key and i i feel like um obviously not completely true there's still plenty of schools that are lagging but like when i did like an ankle lock or a heel hook back in like 2001 it was borderline unstoppable even if it wasn't very good okay like like i was not good back then but i was beating guys that were like technically way way better and more experienced than me just because i was hitting them with a, a weapon they weren't familiar with but now like if you go to a gym that practices leg locks at all like those white belts know how to like heel slipping and, and clear the knee line and all the other stuff that, that, you know, we now consider like vital basic knowledge is actually a part of their basic training. Yeah. Also, I came up in the IVJF, which does not score points for the body triangle. Right. I've been taking jujitsu classes for since 2007. Uh, I went to a 10 planet school the other night. Uh, Templar Bethlehem and my friend Renette Hene was teaching and he showed body triangle scapes. I've never been shown body, body triangle, triangle scape <laughs> like in a, in a class setting. You weren't even showed the, the that janky like you 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 know you you turn them to the to the bottom side and you try to like ankle lock them with their own body triangle. I yeah I seen the, yeah like the yeah whenever yeah, somebody yeah, cover yeah. whenever yeah whenever somebody cover the yank the the Kalimbas locks yeah if you if you will all the little ankle lock variations you can do from the back right I mean, yes but an, yeah. an actual actual escapes like positional escapes right no i like i've never been shown that and it was hilarious i was like i can't believe that you've gotten this far in jiu-jitsu yeah and but like another thing too is like i noticed i was having trouble with that like i mentioned because right. all these guys are so good at the body triangle and i've usually have guys really I, most of them don't work on it because it doesn't score you points right one and the, also the, the control is so much different when I can just grab a jacket and like right. really yeah, glue myself true. to you. So uh, one of the, and I, I'm very fortunate to have certain like really good people in my life in terms of like, we share similar goals and, and, you know, like competitively and like technically. And one of my blue belts, he will ask me about a position, like something kind of obscure, like let's say like a, a Tariko Plata. Okay. He'll be like, Hey, I, I need to know about this Tariqa Plata. I'm like, okay. I like, I'm not an expert. I, I know how to do it. I can probably show you like four to six setups to it. And otherwise like Tark Hopstock has a video on BJJ fanatics, you know, like go fucking study that, <laughs> you know, like get it from the source. But, um, so I'll show him some stuff and inevitably he will be like, okay, that's cool. How would you defend that? And things like that will make me realize that like, on a Tariqa Plata, it's like, I don't know. Like, like I've only been hit by it once. It was by a guy who didn't do it very good. I guess I did this. So we'll like, we'll like go and be like, okay, what do we need to do to take this apart or prevent it from happening? What are the actual steps? And we'll just work back and forth, back and forth until we figure it out. If I don't already have something where it's like, oh, I know that. Like you do this defense and it works. Um, but yeah, like, like, Body triangle is another one like that. Like, there's so many positions that people are like, oh, if I get the guy here, it's over. Like, he can't do anything. And it's like, there's pretty much no position like that. Like, back triangle is another good example. Like, plenty of guys now know how to do a back triangle. Do guys know how to escape a back triangle? Well, once you start doing it enough in the gym, people probably figure it out. But, like, when you first hit him with a back triangle, they're like, what is this sorcery? Yeah. And like you said, I think at one point... If you have, if you're, if you have like, let's say purple belt and above, mm -hmm. and you have a training partner purple belt above, and both of you have mid grade Jiu Jitsu logic, right? You can figure out a lot of these positions as long as, you know, you put the time on them and you just, okay, like you said, you just have to backtrack and go early stage escape. Yeah. I'm getting caught in it. 
and oh shit. <laughs> yeah, I have, well, what do I have to do at the very last second here to, to hope that I don't get tapped? Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like a lot of guys don't actually put that effort in. Like they're waiting for their instruction to instructor to like spoon feed it to them. And if the instructor never does, they're just like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll never know. And I, like, that's just like, I've literally changed schools over stuff like that. Not, not like, Oh, I'm going to leave in a, you know, and then, then like the bridge on fire, but you know, just been like, okay, I don't know how to do this. My coach doesn't know how to do this. Other people are doing this. I need to find somebody who, who can show me this. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, I've, I really believe jujitsu at the end of the day is a vehicle for you to learn how to learn. Yeah. And then you can apply it to anything really. So I, it kind of bothers me when people are, some people just are not interested in that aspect. And for me, that's like my most favorite part of the art is let's figure things figure out. out because that's the way my brain works. Right. But some people are just not interested in it. It's like, yeah, like I'm here for the exercise and like, you know, I learned a few cool techniques and right. that's fine. Like jujitsu is going to be what it is for you. And it's yeah, definitely I, hard for me to understand that. Yeah, like, no, because our brains are not wired that way. Yeah, no, no. I'm like, you're, you're speaking a different language to me, man. Like <laughs> if I just wanted to exercise, I'd, I'd go work out at the gym. So like, well, I love this. This is exercise. That's not the main thing I get out of it. Yeah. All right, Javi. Thank you so much for your time. I think this was, it was awesome. We got to cover a lot of ground. Cool. Well, thanks, uh, for, uh, thanks for letting me share that with our Panda Nation. Yeah. And uh, where can people find your stuff? And I, I <laughs> where can stuff. people find you online? And uh, there's an academy down the pipeline? Down the pipeline? Yeah, yeah. So uh, me, me and my uh, good buddy slash business partner are, are working to open our academy. Uh, we're, we're still scouting locations. Uh, hopefully, hopefully get things off the ground by, by, uh, early next year at the latest um we've got we've got all the resources and everything it's just just finding just the the perfect spot or at least the good enough spot right now is slowing us down um but, yeah orange uh, street your business partner is holding all the money in shiba inu coins <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, every uh, everything is set up just fine you know as of right now so volatility shouldn't affect things too much <laughs> but um yeah, so uh, on Instagram, I'm the Hav, the JAV13. It's an old video game handle that I just can't seem to give up yet. Uh, that's where I post most of my stuff, upcoming seminars. You're not going to see like a ton of technique videos uh, and whatnot. Um, that will probably change in the near future once we have the Academy. Um, I'm on Facebook. Just look me up by my name, Javier Palomo. I probably won't take a friend request from you if I don't know you. If I don't know you, find me on Instagram. Um you know, right now we're, we are, we're not like filming content for the purpose of like BJJ fanatics instructionals and whatnot, but we are kind of working on content to, to have, because we're going to have like an online aspect to the Academy as well. Uh, just because I, nothing drives me crazier than like the student who trains like three times a week, but is like randomly three times a week because of their work or, or other responsibilities. And I want to be able to be like, Yo, we covered this on Monday. Review, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, as soon as we have our mats down, that it's the plan also. And you start in, you film the entire fundamentals curriculum, and then working our way up. Mm -hmm. Fundamentals, which of course includes plenty of leg locks per our discussion, right? Yes. Good. Good. I approve. Yes. So yeah, we'll we'll take that conversation offline. Sounds Thank cool. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening, Panda Nation. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Inverted Gear podcast. You can find us at invertedgear.com as well as your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to give us a like and we'll see you soon.